there, um, I thought it'd be really interesting to maybe do something that's sort of like a study guide. Um, so for one of my classes, I am reading this book um, called Philosophy for Understanding Theology, and it's written by Diogenes Allen. Um, and it's an older book. However, it provides some really good um, philosophical building blocks um, for better understanding theology and how it's formulated. Um, and so I was reading through the Hegel chapter, and I thought it would just be really cool to um, to sort of break out uh, study guide style the pieces that um, that really um, really speak to me as far as how we uh, use Hegel's philosophical structure to um, to create theology. So, um, anyways, uh, the chapter uh, in this book about Hegel is called Hegel and the Restoration of Optimism. And so I'm going to be sort of quoting at length here from Diogenes. Um, so, so yeah, uh, th this is virtually all just, um, just me reading from this, but I'm going to be reading sort of the highlight reel of this chapter, okay? So by history, Hegel means the process of growth of knowledge in the sense of the development of both human consciousness and various disciplines like logic and physics and the development of civilization and institutions. So it's really important for understanding um, Hegel to understand sort of his, uh, his grasp and definition of history. Um, so for Hegel, history is really the progressive self-unfolding and self-realization of the absolute. Um, because Christianity is concerned with history and is teleological in nature, um, there's an affinity between um, the Christian faith and Hegel's philosophical structure. So Hegel developed the idea of a unity or identity which is dialectical in nature. It's an identity which includes within its own unity what is negation or opposite. So this is dialectical tension. So Hegel posits that an absolute with a dialectical unity in which it as spirit or geist becomes other than itself in history or time and then rises above the opposition between itself and the other by knowing itself in the other and by developing itself in the other as well. The final absolute dialectical unity consists in the act of knowing and absolute knowledge in which opposition is included within the absolute spirit in its knowing and overcoming of the other. So at the bottom is the conviction that reality is a continuum so that nothing is ever utterly separate. Um, otherwise, there would be there would never be a hope of bridging the gap between things or connecting things, specifically in regard uh, to subject and object connection. So again, the continuum or spectrum is critical here, not just distinct plots on a map. Um, instead of reality being comprised of discrete or distinct particulars a la Kant, like I just mentioned, Hegel views reality as internally connected and relations are part of identity. So once more, reality is a continuum rather than unique, distinct things or events. Um, so Hegel strikes out really to conceive of logic in a new way that's completely different from Kant. Um, so reality must be presented concretely and cannot be represented by abstractions of logic that does not seem to operate on a yes or no binary. In order to accommodate the new logic, dialectics must come into play. So this is including what something is or not is, how it is different and alike, must be included in the expression. In order to say what something is, one must consider its relations to everything else. So similarly, Hegel's concreteness is to conceive of a particular in its relations to other things and ideally in relation to all else. Equally important is the consideration of time. So reality is a continuum both spatially and temporally. So this goes back to Hegel's assertion that the historical process unfolding is the ultimate reality or the absolute, which is realizing itself. Reality is the process of becoming fuller and more articulated. Hegel views the entire cosmos and its history as the absolute coming into greater actualization and greater articulation in multiplicity in an orderly, rationally understandable way. So this is different from Plotinus. Uh, Hegel posits that as we get more and more concrete articulation in time and space in the course of history, we get a greater and greater realization of the absolute itself. So this is moving away from um, sort of the Stoics transcendent one or unmoved mover. This is a process-oriented um, uh, objective reality. 
So Hegel's philosophical system has three major aspects. That's log logic, nature, and spirit. Logic treats and relates all concepts under the notion of absolute idea. Logic is taken as a whole and is concretely realized and present in the unfolding reality of nature. Nature involves the study of the rise and development of specialized disciplines that investigate nature and study the relations between the disciplines. And spirit includes logic and nature, deepening and enriching the accounts found in each of them. So spirit includes the layers of our consciousness and the relations uh, to what we are not as well. This is important in regard to spirit. The relations of spirit show how subject and object, which are not identical, have an affinity for one another, which is progressively realized through time. Finite spirits and infinite spirit have an implicit unity and difference that is progressively becoming explicit through time. So think about panentheism here. There is immense detail in Hegel's system because it involves all relations between all finite spirits, the state, culture, religion, various achievements, etc. Since all is connected and all exhibits a progressive manifestation of the absolute, what we find is that logic, nature, and history are like the manifestation of a mind unfolding and realizing itself. Wow, right? Logic, nature, and history exhibit an orderly progression which is similar to our own thinking, and they exhibit relations within themselves and to each other that are like the movement of a mind, so the inner workings of the mind. Nature has an inner teleological movement, and human beings are at home here. So nature and history have a progressive unfolding and realization of an inner telos, of which essentially everything, including our own self-realization, is a part. Telos is inherent in reality itself. So for the sake of time, this chapter goes um, over at great length um, Hegel's master and slave dialectic. And so I'm really highlighting the more theological portions here and, and understanding of this system. Um, but uh, the master-slave dynamic is um, important for understanding uh, Hegel's core philosophy as well. So if we think of Hegel's system as having two ends, one is finite mind and the other absolute mind. I want to focus here on the absolute mind, specifically in relation to Christianity. So for Hegel, the highest form of religion is Christianity, and all things are manifestations of the absolute mind. The problem in religion and philosophy and personal life as well is reconciliation for Hegel. Usually we think of reconciliation as a transaction between the holy and profane, uh, but for Hegel it is that God is infinite and the creature is finite. So this is a rift that must be healed. Human beings are in a state of evil, essentially, because they are finite, and finitude itself is evil. So nature is not evil because nature cannot directly fellowship with God as human beings can. Human beings have this capacity, which makes them different. Um, it is the potential for fellowship with God which makes humanity evil, the potentiality. Uh, and humans stay in this sort of evil state until the destiny of fellowship with God is fulfilled. So think about the fall here. For Hegel, Whatever is real must become concrete and manifest in this world. So to be real, God must become manifest, um, must become revealed, and must become knowable as well. So God has absolute freedom, and to make this concrete, God grants independent existence to something that is not divinity. So this is creation. The other thing is the world. The creation is the world, uh, which expresses the absolute freedom that is in God. It is the realization of God's own nature, and the world uh, must become, or does become through fulfillment, God's um, other. So this means God must reconcile this other, the creation, to the divine. So it must be restored in unity. Finitude is only evil because it contrasts to the telos of God's process. It must be united to the infinite. So again, think about that uh, continuum and spectrum here. Very obviously, this relates to humanity's fallen state. The fall is a necessary stage in the life of God and humanity's salvation. Without finitude, God's richness and diversity remains unrealized. God remains potential, not actual. Through the fall, God's richness becomes actual. All separate existence being gathered together into a single unity is reconciliation. Here, human beings become conscious to their unity with the divine or the infinite. This is God realizing divine selfhood in the concrete. This is the reconciliation of the finite and infinite. 
But even now in our state, in our current fallen state, there is still a continuity between us and God. This is representative of the ontological ground of the reconciling work performed by Christ. For Hegel, the incarnation is a necessary event in the life of God. It had to happen because divine and human natures are not alien or completely dissimilar. Whatever is true of God's nature must be concrete in the world of time and space and history as well. The truth that the infinite and the finite are identical requires an instance of a God-human, a concrete instance of the union of the infinite and finite natures. The incarnation shows that finite nature is compatible with divine nature. It shows that reconciliation between the two is completely possible. As God-human, Christ is the major step in the historical process whereby opposition between the infinite and finite spirit is being overcome actively in time and space and history. Hegel's endorsement of the incarnation reversed a philosophical trend departing from enlightenment thinkers um, who saw the incarnation in Christ in a very different way. In Christ, we see the divine identifying itself with the human to the fullest extent by living a human life. His death shows identification with humanity to the fullest degree. Death is the crucial mark of humanity and the finite. All creation dies. Um, Christ endures death to show the total identification of the divine with the human. The incarnation in Christ's life and death bring out the full extent of the bond and essential unity of the infinite and finite. So Christ's death has another aspect which becomes apparent through the resurrection, and that is that the resurrection shows that the finite is destroyed in the death of the God-human. All the natural aspirations and personal ends of the individual existing in independence for himself are given up. Selfish goals are destroyed and taken up into a higher truth about ourselves. Divinity or the infinite are shown to be our true nature. So again, think about uh, unity and reconciliation here. Christ dies for all and all die in Christ. When these events are viewed in light of objective truth, they are seen as moments in the divine life. These moments were not just an accident of history, but were deliberate moments as a realization of part of God's nature. These concretely historical events have ontological importance. It's important to note that what drove Kierkegaard and Karl Barth both crazy about Hegel is that he concedes that the incarnation did not uniquely create the possibility for reconciliation because God and humanity have an underlying unity. So in this sense, Christ is not wholly unique because this continuum lies between uh, the finite and infinite. For both men, Bart and Kierkegaard, God is wholly other and different, and reconciliation is only possible through God's grace alone, so that's critically different from Hegel. For Kierkegaard, to stand in relation to God was to oppose standing in relation to the world. Again, wholly other. Kierkegaard believed that, um, should Hegel had believed his philosophy to be a more of a thought experiment than reality, um, he could have been the greatest thinker of all time. So Kierkegaard writes as such in Fear and Trembling, the paradox of faith is this, that the individual is higher than the universal, that the individual determines his relation to the universal by his relation to the absolute, not his relation to the absolute by his relation to the universal. This chapter also highlights further breaks from Hegel's ideology in cases like D.F. Strauss, Feuerbach, and even Marx uh, via dialectical materialism. Um, along with a split in the field between right-wing and left-wing Hegelianism. So today we could think of Alexander Dugin as almost the right-wing uh, anti-Hegelian um, and Slava Zizek as a, the uh, sort of left-wing torchbearer. Um, both are still working from the Hegelian philosophical structure, but in very, very different ways. Um, so again, I'm reading from uh, Philosophy for Understanding Theology, and this is Diogenes Allen. Um, this is a really good primer about how um, philosophy and theology interplay and how they have built upon each other. Um, and it's very good. You can find it for really cheap. You could probably find a PDF of it too. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks so much for listening about Hegel.